граждане и гражданки Советского Союза. Сегодня в 4 часа утра без предъявления каких-либо претензий к Советскому Союзу, без объявления войны, германские войска напали на нашу страну, атаковали наши границы во многих местах. In the early hours of June 22, 1941, Nazi Germany's plan to invade the Soviet Union, dubbed Operation Barbarossa, officially commenced with a series of air raids and artillery showers. In the following months, the developing Eastern Front of World War II became characterized by constant gunfire, bombardments and casualties spanning from the northern port city of Murmansk all the way to the capital of Moscow itself. With Nazi forces continually pushing east, the Soviet Red Army resisted German advances to the best of their ability, but despite their efforts, the Russians saw huge losses throughout the first year of the war. By the end of 1941, approximately half a year after Germany's initial attacks, the Soviet Union reported over 3 million irrecoverable military casualties, in addition to another 1 million military units that were either wounded or ill. By this time, the Red Army had burned off most of its pre-war military reserves, and was starved for units to hold back the Germans. While military administration scrambled to find more soldiers in unconventional places, the Soviet military continued to weather the German storm, leading to incredibly fierce fighting. for troops, Soviet military command turned to penal enlistment programs instead, forming battalions specifically composed of prison inmates and deserters. These military divisions were established under Stalin's order number 227 and were commonly known as Strafnoi Battalion or Strafbat for short. Often placed at the front lines, these prisoner turned soldiers were forced to participate in frenzied and disorganized advances towards the Germans, which frequently resulted in large casualties amongst these penal military units. Despite this, the few surviving members of the Strafbat were rewarded for their service with pardons for their crimes and released from the Soviet prison system, but very few were able to remain free. It is well known that the Soviet penal system, known today as the Gulags, was utilized heavily by Lenin and Stalin to repress their political opponents and dissenters under the guise of counter-revolutionary crime, but this same system was also used to house common criminals. While it's true that the line between political opposition and common crime became muddled under Soviet law, it's still apparent through official correspondence that the communist government made clear distinctions between offenses rooted in so-called counter-revolutionary agitation and common crime, which they deemed to be socially harmful and socially dangerous elements. The common criminals that were incarcerated in the Gulag system, however, were a minority. Data collected by the Soviet Union's Ministry of Internal Affairs, abbreviated as MVD, found that those who were arrested for non-counter-revolutionary crimes only composed about just under one-third of arrests, clocking in at about 1.49 million individuals out of the total of 4.84 million arrested by the OGPU and KVD from 1921 to 1938. It should be noted that these numbers, provided by Colonel Pavlov of the MVD, have had their accuracy debated extensively by historians. Many, such as Viktor Vasilyevich Luneyev and Alexander Nikolaevich Yakovlev, have asserted that Pavlov's numbers are actually an underestimate, pointing to newfound data showing higher numbers of arrests and sentences. Regardless, it's generally agreed upon that several million prisoners pass through the Gulag system, with a portion of them composed of common criminals. But one of the most interesting and bloody events that took place within the Gulag lies only within a small portion of the common criminals. Of the group of Gulag inmates that were arrested for common crimes, an even smaller percentage were associated with the criminal underworld as organized criminals. If we look at the data regarding the composition of prisoners by their type of crime collected by the NKVD, we see that there is one consistent category within the prison population, gangsterism and brigandage, which made up on average 2.75% of the entire list between the years of 1934 and 1941. While we may not know the NKVD specific definition for gangsterism and brigandage, we have a pretty good idea of what kind of people may have fit the bill to be prosecuted as such. The roots of Russian gangs and organized crime can be traced back to the Tsarist era circa the 1700s. The majority of crime in this time took place within the countryside, consisting of simple robberies and theft. But interestingly, many of these thieves were not perceived as economic leeches, but rather as defenders of the people from Tsarist rule. 
This perception gave birth to Russian criminal folklore, leading to an almost romanticized recollection of life in the Russian Empire. After the toppling of the Tsarist monarchy and the October Revolution that put Vladimir Lenin in power in the newly formed Soviet Union, the thieves began to feel pressure from the government's initiatives to reduce crime. Under Lenin's rule, it was ordered that any and all bandits caught by the authorities must be shot immediately in an extrajudicial manner. But despite this effort, extrajudicial killings of thieves did not deter crime from persisting. It wasn't until the rise of Stalin when a truly systematic suppression of common crime became instituted through the Gulag system. By this time, the scattered bands of thieves that roamed the countryside under the Romanov dynasty had become consolidated into a properly organized criminal group. Known as the Vodiv Zakonia, or the Thieves-in-Law in English, members were easily identified by several unique characteristics, such as their distinct gang tattoos and their special criminal dialect of Russian, called Fienya. Despite the ragtag origins of the Vori, they now had developed a strict code of conduct reminiscent of the America Code adopted by the Sicilian mob. In a report obtained by the Procurator General of the Soviet Union, the laws that the Vori abided by were summarized by a former thief named A. Bulatov, and in it, it can be clearly observed that the thieves-in-law strongly valued reliance and loyalty to each other, as well as firm resistance to any centralized authoritative power outside of the thieves' society. As such, the code of conduct disallowed any thief participation in military, judicial, political, or productive contexts, and it expected all Vori to survive by leeching off of non-thieves, and not by doing honest work. Although the thieves-in-law were now confined to the frigid conditions of Siberian labor camps, their society flourished nonetheless. Surrounded by generally harmless political prisoners and intelligentsia, the thieves found it easy to prey on their fellow inmates for food and other precious resources, with the victims lacking the means to retaliate. Several accounts from political prisoners have reflected their deep hatred for the criminal characters that regularly attacked and stole from them. The thieves' staunch opposition to the Soviet regime also led to clashes with prison authority. Guards were often met with refusals to work at a time when production from labor camps was important for the USSR's economic expansion. As Ivan Chistyakov, a guard stationed at the Baikal Amur mainland labor camp, wrote in his diary, while the guards were busily trying to organize periods of hyperproductivity known as the Hanovite movements, there were some prisoners that repeatedly caused delays, complications, and general unproductivity for the entire camp. Fortunately for both the more educated inmates and the guards, the power dynamic that kept the Vori strong wouldn't stay in place for very long. Having lost several major cities including Kiev, Minsk, and Smolensk to Germany throughout the year of 1941, and with German troops sitting at the doorsteps of Leningrad, Stalingrad, and Moscow, the Red Army began to enlist troops from the Gulag system. As we touched on earlier, this penal enlistment program formed several Strafbat units to be placed at the front lines. The historical significance of these units is perhaps not found in their contributions to defending the Soviet Union against German advances, but rather in the division that it caused in the Gulags. Recall that the Code of Conduct governing the lives of the thieves-in-law forbade any cooperation with the Soviet government, including participation in military activities. For some of the thieves-in-law, freedom from the freezing temperatures and squalid conditions of the Gulag was much more important than a list of commandments handed down to them from their secret society. And as such, believing that they'd be freed from their sentences, a sizable portion of the Vori enlisted into penal infantry units, with many joining the famed 16th Army headed by Konstantin Rokossovsky. Following the conclusion of World War II, many of the prisoners serving in the Strafbate looked forward to their release from incarceration, but many found that the promises of clemency made by Stalin turned up empty. And for those thieves-in-law who were able to get out of the military, almost all of them quickly learned that old habits die hard, landing themselves back into the Gulag system for various crimes. As author and former Gulag inmate Varlam Shalomov so eloquently writes in one of his essays, soon the Soviet course of the post-war period met with old acquaintances during their sessions. It turns out, not that it was difficult to foresee, that the recidivists, thugs, thieves, people, and the underworld didn't even think about ceasing the activities that gave them a means of livelihood, creative excitement, moments of genuine inspiration, as well as status in their society from before the war. Evidently, most if not all of the Vori outside of the Gulags eventually and inevitably found their way back into the system, reunited with their compatriots who did not enlist in the Soviet army. And yet they were not met with a receptive welcome. Instead, instant hostility and tension began to brew between the two groups. Those who did not enlist believed that by accepting a position in the Red Army, a voter had essentially betrayed the exclusive society of the thieves-in-law, and as such should be either expelled from the group or be met with death. Now, whether service in the Soviet army was the sole cause of hostility between the two groups is a subject that has led to different conclusions. Some, like Shalomov, imply that World War II was a major cause of tension in the Gulag, only slightly worsened by cooperation with the authorities. Whereas Adam Roger, at the time a graduate student at Miami University, argues in his master's thesis that the majority of those alienated by the thieves did not serve in the war to begin with. 
Regardless, the division that now existed between the two groups gave rise to two distinct criminal syndicates, the antiquated but ardent society of the Vori of Zakonia, who were guided by a strict set of rules, and the expelled Vori, who evidently valued self-interest over any kind of code of conduct, becoming known as a Suki, which roughly translates to English as the Bitches. And thus, the Bitch Wars commenced. Taking notice of this internal strife, camp authorities seized upon what they perceived to be an opportunity to convert select hardened criminals into more compliant allies of the state as bitches. Guards reportedly used both positive and negative enforcement tactics to pressure less dedicated thieves to betray the society of the Vori. These tactics included offering less intensive labor assignments, better food, and even positions of camp authority to those who cooperated. And for those who didn't, guards resorted to physical violence and threats to persuade weaker thieves into submission. This does beg the question, however, of why the camp authorities were willing to invest the time and effort in fragmenting the Thesan law. It isn't likely the guards brought recidivists out of criminal organizations through the kindness of their own hearts, given the horrendous conditions that even the guards had to endure in the gulags. So there must have been some kind of added benefit that the guards could reap from investing these efforts. As it turns out, the relationship between the bitches and gulag authority was of a symbiotic nature. For the guards, moving the thieves away from their strict code of conduct allowed them to conduct some sort of labor benefiting the camps. By taking on labor tasks that were prohibited by the Thieves' Code, or traditionally refused by the Thiesen Law, the guards were able to inch closer to meeting their labor quotas, which ultimately made life easier for them. The bitches, on the other hand, benefited through relatively greater freedoms within the camp, and connections with guards that would prove advantageous in their clashes with the old thieves. Although this was the typical relationship between the guards and the bitches, in certain more extreme cases, guards reportedly took advantage of the existing conflict between the bitches and the thieves in order to kill off the unproductive thieves, effectively cleansing the prison population using the bitches as what were essentially contract killers. In one instance recorded by ex-gulag inmate and acclaimed writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn, guards stationed at the Vorkuta Gulag brought in a bitch to neutralize a group of turbulent thieves. That same night, the bitches mobilized and the hit was carried out, leaving three dead thieves and no other repercussions. Now equipped with their ever-strengthening faction of thief and law outcasts and support from camp authority, the bitches were ready to take revenge against their former comrades. Their conflicts were bloody to say the least, with several gulag inmates recounting the brutal aftermath of clashes. Memoirists and other authors providing first-hand accounts reported that axings and stabbings were commonplace in the bitch wars, and killing methods were varied with the belligerents using whatever they could find as weapons. Knives, axes, saws, spades, glass shards, bricks, rocks, all landed in the hands of the bitches and thieves as instruments of murder. Dantik Sergeyevich Baldayev, a former guard assigned to the Kresti prison in Leningrad, recalled daily conflicts between the bitches and the thieves, and described an instance where a hacksaw was used by thieves-in-law to kill a bitch. And on the other side of the bars, Georgi Evgenievich Trifonov, a thief-in-law better known by his alias Mikhail Diomin, illustrated in his autobiography the grisly death of a fellow thief who had just killed a bitch. The man, named Leo, was found dead in solitary confinement with his body hacked up beyond recognition and his eyes clawed out, and so continued the senseless killing and desecration carried out by both sides of the war until only one group remained victorious. It's without a doubt that both the thieves and the bitches sustained large numbers of casualties throughout the course of the bitch wars, but quickly it became increasingly obvious who was on the losing side. The relationship with camp authority that the bitches had cultivated proved truly advantageous in their encounters with the thieves-in-law. And with the aid of both passive negligence and active assistance from the guards, the number of thieves-in-law residing in the camps quickly began to dwindle. The world of the old thieves had in essence been demolished, and its members eradicated. Approximations of the number of surviving thieves following the conclusion of the bitch wars are shaky, but some place a number at 300 residing in the prison system by the 1950s, and nearing zero in the subsequent decade. Others argue that only a few dozen survived in the entirety of the USSR by the 1970s. Regardless, one thing was clear. The bitches had achieved a definitive victory over their former brothers, raising their secret society to the ground and taking thousands of lives in the process. Yet that is not to say that organized crime as a whole was destroyed nearing and after the collapse of the Soviet Union. In fact, it was quite the opposite. By the 80s, even before the USSR's collapse, criminal enterprise had already started to flourish. The surviving bitches and what remained of the thieves started to get their feet into the door of burgeoning protection rackets, offering their services to businessmen dealing in less than legal goods. As Russia began to incorporate aspects of the free market near the rear end of 1991, Russian businesses were cast into an anarcho-capitalist state, or in simpler terms, into economic limbo. 
With inadequate business regulations and even worse enforcement, businesses turn to gangs in order to achieve some semblance of standardized protection of property and enforcement of business activities. As a result, the presence of criminal groups skyrocketed in post-Soviet Russia to the point where commercial and criminal enterprise became firmly intertwined. By all means, this new generation of criminals should have been an entirely new breed, shrewd businessmen looking to exploit every crook and cranny of the fall of communism instead of the strict and exacting outlaws that were the thieves in law. And yet, by the 80s and 90s, after the Khrushchev thought that led to waves of amnesty throughout the gulags, there was a marked shift back to old ways, reverting to the strict abidance to a code of conduct. The thieves in law may have been eradicated in numbers, but as it seems, they never truly died in essence. The same tenets that were upheld by the thieves in law almost a century ago remain in place today, just followed by a different group of people on a much larger scale. Discounting the thousands killed in the gulags, it was as if the bitch wars never existed at all. Thank you so much for watching. My name is John, and this was the hidden bloodbath within the Soviet gulag system. <laughs>